Bonjour et bienvenue sur la chaîne Food Normandie. Aujourd'hui, on a le plaisir de recevoir euh, le docteur euh, Jessica Malberg qui a euh, publié dans euh, Biological Psychiatrie un superbe article euh, donc, euh, concernant les antidépresseurs et notamment euh, la neurogénèse, hein, la pousse de nouveaux neurones euh, grâce aux antidépresseurs. So, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Malberg, uh, to be with us. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation to speak with you. Um, it's a pleasure. So um, I have a PhD in neuropharmacology, and I um, really got into neurogenesis, and I can explain a little more, in the laboratory of Ron Duman at Yale University. This was a professor that had studied lots of effects of antidepressants, and we then looked at the effect of antidepressants on neurogenesis. Um, we can talk about that in detail. Uh, since then, I've worked at multiple um, uh, large pharma, and I'm currently at a biotechnology company, always looking at the effects of antidepressants on the brain. Sure, I'm happy to. So, um, so I can go, the first studies that were done Um, were done right around the time that people were discovering that neurogenesis occurred in the adult. Um, when I was in graduate school, I mean, until I was a postdoc, we were told you were born with a number of cells and that is it. Um, so it was a big change. And this was in the late 1990s by Fred Gage and Elizabeth Gould that showed that animals in the hippocampal, in the hippocampus In, you know, you had constant turnover of, neuro, of, anti, of uh, cells throughout their life. And so that was a big change. And then the second change that were the, uh, in complementary studies was that stress decreased the number of cells that were born. And it had been known that stress decreased atrophy, increased atrophy of your brain. So Bruce McEwen had shown a lot of data that, and he could measure CA3 cells. And again, um, those are just the cells that are in your hippocampus. The hippocampus is important for um, memory, emotion, and um, con high, big connections with the frontal cortex. And so it's really intrinsic into a lot of um, uh, functions that you need, both for depression and just everyday life. So these two points that um, neurogenesis occurred in the hippocampus and stress decreased hippocampus led us to ask the question, well, what do antidepressants do? since one idea, and this is really where we focus on, that stress in, or depression in animals is really the effect of stress. What does a de depressed brain look like? You can mimic that by stressing an animal. And so what do people report when they're depressed? Often, although not always, it's a stressful situation in their life or constant stress. Um, so we looked at numerous studies. We gave animals antidepressants, And we found that you could actually count the number of newborn cells in the hippocampus. And we saw there was an increase in the number of cells. And the link that really made it critical was that you needed about two to four weeks of antidepressants on, given to the animal for this to happen. And this was a big translational, um, this, this is a big translational finding because in humans, you also need at least, you know, two weeks at the minimum, you'll probably see, as you know, you'll see an effect maybe at two weeks, but you really need four to six weeks to show an effect. And so this was one of the first times you were mimicking in an animal the need for long-term administration of an antidepressant. So that's, uh, that's where we got to our first big studies was that you could see it in the animal and it took a chronic time course to see. Um, we think so because, you know, we know that you get, it, we know that with almost every antidepressant, you need that two weeks and we know what the drugs are doing in the brain. So when the drugs, for example, an SSRI binds to the serotonin transporter, there's a whole host of things that happen we call them downstream effects. You need to upregulate pathways and importantly, you need to increase trophic factors and trophic factors are the, um, It's basically, you know, the bath that your neurons sit in, and those are the micro environment around your cells. So you not for the cells to be born, you need something, you need the environment to be, you know, a supportive environment. So it's not just the cell is born, you need, it's a multi-factor effect. So you need the pathway to be activated, 
you need, we know that we need to activate. And then there's other studies that you need chronic activation of the pathway. You need an increase in trophic factors. And that is going to lead to the newly born cells being born and to have them be functional. And there's new, there's new studies recently that the newly born cells integrate into the brain and are functional. So it's not just the cell is born, there's multiple steps leading up to it. And we think that is that may be one reason that you need that at least two week period because it's not just a quick, you know, you need the whole pathway to be, to be um, activated. So our understanding is that once your cell, once you have an increase in neurogenesis, that constant increase of serotonin and neuro, um, norepinephrine, and in some cases with bupropion dopamine, that, that constant activation of neurotransmitters um, leads to constant activate, so it uh, leads to the constant turnover of the cells or the, in, the increase in neuro, new cells. What we don't know, and I, I don't know if you're getting this, when antidepressants stop working, does that mean they've stopped making new cells? And, and we don't know that yet. Um, we do know that then if you move to another antidepressant, that often helps. And um, so they show, yeah, the short answer to your question is, you know, as long as you're taking antidepressants, neurogenesis is occurring. And one way to think of it, if you have a new set point, so you, maybe you're not, you know, antidepressants are increasing the number of cells, you need that increased number of cells and you need to keep the antidepressant on board to keep that to keep that turnover going uh, ongoing, and we think that's one reason um, you may need to keep taking the antidepressants. Again, your brain, you know, if you if your brain needs constant activation to make your new cells. Um, I think in in some people, yes, because in some people, when you stop taking antidepressants and stop neurogenesis. That you go back into your into your uh, depressed state. Uh, for some patients, that increase in neurogenesis for that you know maybe one year time point is enough to produce the changes, the long term changes in your hippocampus and limbic system. So I'd say it really depends on the person, but in the people who've recovered, then it does seem that your brain, you know, if you think of the negative effects of stress, you're protected against those negative effects of stress. Um, that prevents future um, depressive episodes. Um, I think, so I look at it as what brain areas are affected in both anxiety and depression, and that it's very hard to tease the two apart. So with the exception of say a panic attack, which you do not see in depression, um, I'd say a lot of the symptoms of depression and anxiety overlap so much is that you're seeing a similar disease spectrum. And we know that the, with the exception of the benzodiazepines, the SSRIs are all approved for anxiety as well as depression. So um, I think I, I look at it as they're really, the, the symptoms overlap and it's those, the, those diseases really overlap with each other. Um, we, we do, um, it's less well reported, but we know that patients with both anxiety, you know, we, a lot of the anxiety studies um, if you give an anxiolytic, you get an increase in neurogenesis. And so we're, we're, we're seeing a similar effect. Okay. You're, you're, I mean, I think you're right. You're right. Anxiety is not really discussed as much as depression, but there's such an overlap. Um, I think that's an excellent point to bring up. And I, I know there's some like social anxiety. Um, there's depressive aspects that say, you know, I know there's one publication that um, bordeoxetine, uh, Trintella or Brintella, Trintellix, um, affects both the depression and anxiety, but in a different time course. But both symptom section, but both symptom domains are um, are really affected by this drug. Thank you. <laughs> there is. Um, I've been in drug discovery for a long time. So um, one of the so when we first had the paper, I joined you know, a pharmaceutical company, many pharmaceutical companies were started to see could neurogenesis be the next mechanism of action of antidepressants. And I would have loved to say yes, but unfortunately there has been no drug where we know it's, you know, it just increases um, neurogenesis. So in that sense, um, the field has not discovered a new and new antidepressant. But the idea of antidepressants increasing neurogenesis and really increasing synaptic plasticity, that really has taken off. So the idea that the brain is plastic, it's affected by stress and environment and antidepressants, 
um, really has led to an appreciation of the mechanism of action of new antidepressants. So ketamine, for example, um, it is antidepressant. We think, and they think the mechanism of action is by affecting the mTOR pathway. And that is truly just in, um, affected by synaptic plasticity. So um, it's been an indirect, um, it, so the discovery of neurogenesis has really led to what are antidepressants doing to the entire brain, looking at you know the trophic factors and plasticity. So it's really had a bigger impact that way than discovering a new drug that increases neurogenesis. But I also think that makes sense because if you, because again, you needed that two weeks, the pathway needs to increase. You need everything around your cells to improve. Maybe just targeting the new cells isn't enough. It is a whole pathway. So I think there's an appreciation that you need to target the whole plat, you know, you can have a final readout of neurogenesis, but that's not going to be just the way the, the, the antidepressant works. It's a more general, it's a more global effect. Um, okay. And then it affects lots of other brain regions in um, addition to the uh, hippocampus. <laughs> can, can we say that? Um... I think exercise, that's critical. I think that's very, you know, you're getting new cells by exercise. And, you know, I think there's a reason exercise produces a very, you know, exercise, not for everyone, but um, exercise can be very antidepressant. And I think that has the most direct effect. Um, sleep and circadian rhythms also, um, I think the circadian system affects your hippocampus and your limbic system critically. So it may not be directly how you're working, but you need to, you need to normalize your, your whole system. And if you normalize your circadian patterns, um, that will allow, that will allow better, you know, better normalization of your brain. So I think that's an indirect effect. And I think just the, uh, looking at food and looking at the effects of the microbiome, um, I'm really impressed by the recent papers that what you eat affects your gut and your gut affects your brain. Yes. And there is a link between the microbiome and normalization and neurogenesis. So I guess, so John Cryan um, at um, in Dublin, in uh, University College Dublin, he's been doing a lot of data. So I think the, the food, it is affecting neurogenesis, maybe indirectly through the microbiome, but ab absolutely. And... I'm sorry? Maybe a last word, something you want to, to, to tell us? Oh, um, you know, I, I think neurogenesis is sort of, it comes and goes in importance, but I think with the, you know, with the appreciation of ketamine, and then again, looking at the microbiome data, I think, you know, just keeping in mind that your brain is plastic and that these antidepressants, stress, your food is all contributing to the health of your brain. The readout is neurogenesis. And I think that's something, you know, I think for, for patients to really what's happening in my brain, I think that's a really good way of, of looking at it. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Malberg, to be uh, with us. It was an honor for us. And uh, maybe- um, Thank you. <laughs> next time. <laughs> Thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye.